this lady picked up the phone. I will never forget this woman's name. It was Doreen. I think of her almost daily. She is someone whose last name I will never know and whose face I'll likely never see who changed the course of my life. She told me about the program they offered and she asked me questions about my drinking. She stayed on the phone with me for half an hour talking about my drinking. And at the end of it, she said, you know, honey, have you ever tried a 12-step program? And I said, no, what is that? And she goes, well, Alcoholics Anonymous is an example of that. And I heard her clicking on the other side of the phone on her computer. And she said, okay, I pulled one up. You said you're in the Dallas area. There's one in Irving, Texas called The Gift. And here's the address. And I'm like, oh my God, that's like less than five miles from my house. The next day I, I went in. Because of that conversation I had with that stranger, that's why I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Well, hello, my little chickadees. That was the voice of Miss Tammy, you that you heard at the beginning of this episode, and you are going to hear much more from her in just a moment. But first things first, this episode is brought to you by Mr. Kevin. You know what Kevin did? Kevin went to our website, silverspeak.com. He clicked on the little PayPal donate tab and he made a contribution. Thank you so much, Kevin, for your generosity. This episode goes right out to you. And folks, just as a reminder, please be assured the donations that come in go directly to the expenses related to this podcast, such as software subscriptions and hardware and there's all kinds of things that you, you need to have in order to keep a podcast like this going. I will never profit from the podcast, promise you. My sponsor keeps me very, very straight on this. This is just service work, just trying to give away what was so freely given to me. All right, I will be the chairperson for this meeting between meetings, and I am truly honored and privileged to serve all of you that are listening in. I've had a few people ask me lately, they say, hey, John, how do we actually subscribe? And by the way, when you say subscribe, there's no charge for it. It's just something you do through an app. Some people think that there's a charge because they hear the word subscribe. But if you don't know how to subscribe to the podcast and you just want to get notifications every time a new one comes up. Uh, I have a couple of different ways of doing that. And you can text the word sober, S-O-B-E-R, to 31996. You text the word sober, S-O-B-E-R, to 31996, and it'll give you well, a couple of different things. Number one, you can subscribe to our email list through that text. And the other thing is it will show you how to subscribe to both Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts, which is formerly known as iTunes. All right. Mark your calendar, folks. I haven't been talking about it a ton up to this point, but now I'm starting to get really excited about it because I know exactly what's happening. I know when it's happening and I know the topics we're going to cover the whole nine yards. So mark your calendar for Sober Speak Live again on December 6th. Okay. Now it's here in the North Texas area in Frisco, Texas at the Grace Avenue United Methodist Church in Frisco. And we are going to have as our special guest, Ms. Brenda J. Now she has, when I say she, Brenda, she has the number 
one, the most listened to episode on Sober Speak of all time. That is episode number 90, nine zero, uh, and it's called God and Grace. And even if you have listened to that before, do yourself a favor and go back and listen to it again. And if you haven't listened to it, I would highly advise you go back and listen to it. It is a incredibly powerful um, testimony, we'll call it. I just, uh, she shares her experience, strength and hope, what she was like, what happened and what she is like now. But anyway, we're going to be having her live, uh, at the, at the event from 6 30 PM to 8 PM. Now, a lot of our literature is set up to this point that it's going to be from seven to eight 30. We had to change that by 30 minutes. We'll get it, uh, uh, worked out, uh, on, on, uh, wherever we are, Instagram and Facebook and, uh, the emails and all that sort of stuff, but just keep in mind it's from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. We are going to be covering four topics, all right? By the way, uh, the the evening is called An Evening with Brenda J. Full of Love, Light, and Laughter, and that is a perfect way to describe Brenda J. So we will be addressing four topics with Brenda J. Number one is grief. Number two is forgiveness. Number three is compassion. And number four is grace. We plan to spend 15 minutes-ish on each of those topics. And if you are in the secret Facebook group, we will post a request for you to, or not a request, just a, an option for you to ask your questions regard, regarding these four subjects. Once again, grief, forgiveness, compassion, and grace. Uh, and, um, you'll be able to put your question in the hat, uh, or you can just send me an email to John, J O H N at soberspeak.com. I can't guarantee that your question will make the final cut for Brenda J on that night, but, uh, what the heck, give it a shot, right? We will have free childcare available. Yes, I said free childcare available for those who need it. So come on down. Don't let the kids stop you. Uh, this event is free. I do pass a basket at the end of the, um, at the end of the session, uh, just to cover some expenses. If you want to pitch in, great. If not, no big whoop. We just want you to be there in a seat. We will also, folks, be having live music from Miss Wendy Child. What an amazing talent. Wendy is, and we are so lucky to have her. She was there at our first event, and I am going to play for you right now uh, one of her original songs called Nobody, uh, and I will be playing the entire song at the, at the end of this episode after listener feedback, but if you want to meet Wendy in person, come on down, meet her at the live event, and I will put a link in the show notes, the episode notes, whatever we call it, just pause your device and look at the notes for this particular episode. I'll put a, a link to her music, uh, which she has out on the Spotify channel, and I'll be featuring some of Wendy's uh, other songs over the next couple of months on the podcast. And by the way, her name is Wendy, just like the hamburger, W-A-E-N-D-Y, -Y, Y, excuse me, last name Child with no S on the end. So here is some of Wendy's music right now, just a taste of it. And once again, I'll play the rest of it after listener feedback at the end. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Tammy Yu. Hey, that rhymes, doesn't it? Anyway, here's Tammy Yu. Okay, everybody. So today we are sitting here with Miss Tammy Yu. 
Well, first of all, Tammy, can you go ahead and introduce yourself and give your sobriety date if you wish? Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm Tammy Yu, and my sobriety date is August 25th, 2013. Well, you just had a birthday. I did, indeed. Yep, six years. Six years. Congratulations, Miss Tammy Yu. Thank you. I got to tell you, though, every time I say Tammy Yu, I'm thinking about, like, I'm going to send my kids to college at Tammy Yu, but you're not a university, <laughs> right? I most definitely am not that. Okay, no. just making sure. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm, I'm so glad to have Tammy here today. Uh, congratulations on your six years. Thank you. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about your story today. Um, all right. So, Tammy, first of all, I want to ask you on the front end. I know because, OK, just so everybody knows here, I have familiarity with Tammy because we go to the same group, the Frisco group uh, in uh, in, te- in Texas. So I have some familiarity with her story, but I've never heard her tell her actual full story. So I wanted to bring her in here and hear it. And I wanted you all to hear it as well. And I know that, Tammy, you have a a business background, correct? And that yes. was part of your identity coming in here. Correct. Uh, yeah. and, and still is to some degree, I'm sure, right? So talk a little bit about your, your business background and where you came from. Yeah. Well, um, the majority of my business career was actually in direct sales, business to business sales for any salespeople out there. Um, and in a pretty recognized organization nationally, for a good 25 years, I worked for them. So I was with them a, a great long while, and it was a really good organization. And I will say that my identity was 99% wrapped up in, in how I thought I did and what I achieved in that role. Gotcha. That makes mm-hmm. sense. So, yep. so you were, you were a, a, a businesswoman. You were 25 years with the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, like you said, 99% of your identity. So you, so you got up, I guess you would eat, live and breathe the world of business. Would I be correct in assuming I, that? I really did. If I wasn't actually at the office working or at an appointment somewhere, then I was thinking about strategies and how was I going to project and get further within the business organization. It was, it was, uh, all consuming, I would say. Good. And I got to say, before we go any further, your voice sounds to me as it's perfect for a podcast. You sound kind of like you have a, an NPR type of a voice. And that is a very good thing to have. You know what NPR is? I do not. No, oh, NPR no. and national public radio. They oh, do okay. a lot of, uh, uh, I don't, you know, they do all kinds of, they do podcasts, in fact. Uh, so it's, it's a compliment. Uh, all right. So. Let's then go back and talk about Tammy as a uh, as a youngster. If I were to go back and talk to one of your teachers back then, and they were to to describe Miss Tammy, you, how would they describe you? Um, I think I would probably I was not a troublemaker in any way. In fact, I was very shy, um, and timid, and quiet. And I was a relatively good student, but sort of the more I could be invisible the harder I tried to be just that. Which is interesting that you ended up being in business. Right. Yes. Wow. And specifically sales. And I'll tell you that was an intentional choice because I recognized that I was timid and shy and I hated it about myself. And I would have done anything to challenge myself to be something different. Hmm. That is very interesting. I, I I like that you. So you went to work on some things that you where you thought you fell short, and you chose a career of sales in order to do that. Was that very uncomfortable at first? It was always uncomfortable. I never really got comfortable with it. Although I did experience a fair amount of success in it. Surprisingly, I was never comfortable with it, which only supported my drinking patterns. You know, I definitely needed to take that edge off every single day. Okay. All right. So let's talk about your family growing up. Talk to me about that situation. Where were you? What part of the country did you grow up in? Okay. Yeah. I'm a Midwesterner by heart. I was raised in Minnesota. 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 And I grew up in a little resort community in Minnesota. Uh, Population total at that time was under 10,000 people. And um, it was beautiful country. I was the youngest of five. And there's quite a variance in our ages. So my oldest sister is 18 years older than me. Um, and I will, will say my family was lower middle income. We, we had everything we needed, a house, two cars, all the food 
you know, no, we didn't struggle with that or worry about that, but we didn't have a lot of excess. And I remember from a very young age, looking at people around me who had more and deciding, you know, I absolutely wanted to get in a position where I had more as an adult than what my family had. So that was a driver for you. It was. Yeah. Okay. So you're famous. So you had five brothers and sisters. Uh, and once again, I asked a, a previous guest, this, this seems like a very, uh, stereotype type of question, but you're in the Midwest. You have five brothers yeah. and sisters. Were you Catholic? <laughs> no. And it was four. I, there are five oh. of us, but I had two brothers and two sisters. Uh, no, not Catholic, Lutheran, grew gotcha. up Lutheran, but they all had, my parents both had very large families. So it was, it was normal to have a very large family up where I grew up. Any alcoholism in the family? All, all over the place. I mean, um, cousins and uncles and my father. Did you recognize that they had a problem with drinking at the time? Or was that more in retrospect? You know, I recognized my father first. Um, and even then it took me quite a while to understand what was going on with him. I was pretty afraid of him as a child because he was very, I perceived him as being very volatile and he was, um, verbally very volatile. And I didn't recognize until I got probably in high school years and my mom started talking about him being an alcoholic, uh, that that's in fact what he was. Really? Mm -hmm. And so, well, you described him a little bit, but go, so go into your dad there a little bit more and how the family reacted to your dad. Did he end up, uh, did he ever quit drinking? What happened with him? Yeah. So I would say this is interesting because my older siblings and I've had discussions and their experience growing up with my father was vastly different than mine. And I have one brother who's two years older than me. Uh, of course, he was much more progressed in his disease when we were children. He was in his late forties at that time. And he was, like I said, I was afraid of him when I was a child because he was explosive. And so I tried not to ever be like, for instance, in a room alone with him. I just really didn't want much to do with him, and he didn't seem interested in us either. But then as I got older, I also started recognizing that he was a very sad individual. He actually had a really kind heart, which my mom always kind of stood up for him about him having a very kind heart and disposition. Um, he was actually a juvenile probation officer, and he worked with the kids in our community, and they loved him. But where he had enormous amounts of time for them, for his family, he had, he had very little. And so we were never connected like you would expect a child and the father to be. Did any of the, you said some of the other kids in the family had a different perception? Yeah, well, they did. I think when he was younger, he was more carefree and they said he was very fun and lively and adventurous when he was younger. But by the time um, my brother Rob and I were born, he had really disengaged. And, and now I understand it because I understand the progressive nature of the illness and I experienced it personally. So I get how that happened. But as a child, I just, I didn't understand him and I could not connect with him and I did not respect him. Mm. Did he ever sober up? He ended up dying from the disease. Um, well, and he also smoked. So he had cancer and a stomach, liver, lung. When he was diagnosed and he had home health care, he stopped then. I think he tried about uh, in recovery for a little while, but my family was very secretive about what was going on. All I knew is he had gone to a hospital for a while. And now whether that was because he was ill already or because of his alcoholism, I still to this day do not know the answer to that. Hmm. Okay. So how old were you when he passed? I was 21. Okay. When he passed. So you are, okay. So let's go through your teenage years and what you did up to when you got to, to be 21. Were you, were you still in the house? Had you left? No, I was in the house. I was, um, sort of trying to be a good kid. And I say sort of because I compared myself a lot to my older siblings who had achieved quite a bit, especially scholastically. Um, and I didn't even try to measure up to that. So I didn't try at school. What I focused on was trying to be social. I wanted friends. Um, so that was my avenue. I didn't try and make waves when I was growing up, although I did get in trouble here and there. I, I remember distinctly being um, approached by the police one night at a kager. I couldn't walk anymore because I, I was had had way too much to drink. I was probably 15 at the time. But I never got in trouble because my father was a probation officer. Mm. My uncle was the sheriff of the town I grew up in. And, uh, you know, they just let my date drive me home. Yeah. 
So I didn't get in any particular trouble when I was growing up, nor did my parents approach me with concern over my drinking or behaviors at that time. All right, so take me up to 21. Uh, so you, you were still in the house when your father passed? Is that right? No, so I went to college. Okay. I uh, graduated from high school and I went to college. I, I really wanted to drop out of high school at 16, but my mother had this huge influence on me and I didn't want to disappoint her. So she didn't let me drop out of high school and she expected me to go to college. So I did go to college in Northern Minnesota, um, which is where my drinking career just really took off. I loved college. I mean, you could drink every day there and everybody was doing it. And I finally fit in like many, many alcoholics my whole life, even prior to the first drink, I felt like there was something a little off with me. Like I couldn't quite fit in, like there was something insufficient with me. But from the moment I took that first drink, I just found relief from all of that. I was social. I was courageous. I was intelligent. Um, and in college that really, that I, I managed to graduate. I'm not quite sure how, but I was so despondent when it was all over because I thought, no, oh, no, now I'm going to actually have to be go out, be responsible. Right. This is all going to end. Yeah. <laughs> so he died my, my senior year in college. Okay. All right. So you get out of school and, uh, did you, where did you move around the country? What did, what happened then? No, I got out of school. And like I said, I was really concerned about what next. Mm -hmm. I was kind of lost. And um, I had a friend who had graduated a year ahead of me and she had moved on to Texas, living with her cousin and got a job here. And she said, well, why don't you just come down here and check it out? So I thought, okay, why not? Um, and I had $200 in my pocket and my clothes is all I owned. And I packed up my car and I drove south. And I ended up in the Dallas area. Um, which was a vi very big culture s shock. I came from the Midwest. I came from small communities. And here I land in DFW. I felt there was straw hanging out of my back pocket. Um, <laughs> ever more reason to drink, right? <laughs> to cover up all that. But again, I wanted to do that. I've had this tendency in my life while feeling insufficient to try and challenge myself to get over it. I mean, I'd heard that all my life. You got a problem, just get over it, work on it, whatever. So I was insecure and timid. And I thought, well, if I go somewhere where nobody knows me, surely I'll grow up. There'll be nobody to help me. It's going to happen. It's kind of that Midwest, uh, pull yourself up by your own Absolutely. type of mentality. Yeah. I mean, which, you know, there's some real good parts to that, right? But when it comes to getting over alcoholism, it is, uh, it can be an impediment, if you will. Mm -hmm. All right. So you get down here to Dallas, you got straw hanging out of your back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then did you do, is that when you got your job sort of business? How did that work? Yeah. Out? Yeah. So I, I got a job first. I was in the restaurant business. I was an assistant manager of a restaurant, which was just a hideous job to me because you long hours, not much time off. Um, I, again, I was envious about my friends who had these white shirt jobs, white collar shirt jobs. And, um, so I interviewed and got a job with this company I referred to before. It was a very prestigious organization. I started at the very bottom of the rung there. Um, but I think that they liked the fact that I was willing to step out and take what they viewed as I was a risk taker. And I was in a sense, but I wasn't doing it for all the right reasons. I was doing it to sort of circumvent this inferiority issue that I had going on. So I kept applying for promotional positions and I was fortunate and kept I kept receiving them mm. and started experiencing success. Um, but the problem is when you have a lot of disposable income, when you're an alcoholic of my nature, is you have lots of opportunities to continue that that habit. And of course, I did. And over time, it, it caught up with me. Okay. And so, and so this is just going through my mind. Um, I haven't heard any... Or, or, any men mentioned in this particular or, okay. or, or relationships? Mm -hmm. Were there relationships along the oh, way? Oh, of course there were, <laughs> you know, because that was going to change my whole life experience as well. Um, I had a tendency to stick with the same guys for long periods of time. So I didn't date a lot of different men, but I had a lot of longer term relationships. And when I was 29, I met the man I married. I was married to this man who I thought on paper, we were really good match because he had the same values that I did. He also was a high achiever and he thought status meant a nice house, a nice car 
and prestige was more important to him than character. And I would say I was the same way. Mm -hmm. So I thought we would make a good team. And in fact, it was terrible. Um, he was, I don't want to, I shouldn't label him because he did the best he could, but I, he was an angry guy like my father. He would rage like my father did. And I was, he was a rageaholic. I was an alcoholic. It was a killer combo. Right. Yeah. All right. So, so then now we're getting up toward, uh, uh, when did you start to realize that you're having a drinking problem? In my early thirties, I remember talking to both my husband at the time and my best friend, um, both of them and saying, you know, I'm pretty sure I have a drinking issue because by that time I always had to have something in the house and I always, I couldn't stop when I wanted to stop. I it was never just one. And I recognized that, but both of them kind of, well, my husband said, if you can't be a social drinker, I'm not going to stay married to you because I'm not going to be married to an alcoholic and I need to have someone who can drink socially with me. And then my best friend said, oh, no, you're not bad. You're fun when you drink. Now, by this time, she no longer lived in Dallas. She had moved to another state. So she had not seen how things had progressed. And I did not tell her. So she didn't do it out of anything malicious. She just didn't see what was starting to happen. She was trying to support her friend. Right. Best she could. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, so that's when you start to realize more like the uh, early thirties or so. So, uh, what year, what, what approximately when was that? What year? I would say it was around, um, the late nineties, 98, 99, probably okay. when I realized I had a problem. Okay. So we have a big gap there, right? From 1989 yeah. <laughs> to, uh, 2013. So. That's right. Yeah. Take me through some highlights and yeah. lowlights of those years, whatever you want to say. So I have the delusion issue. You know, the big book is is really, it struck me when I read it, how much was relevant to the path I took in my alcoholism. So I thought, even though I recognized I had a drinking problem and I figured I was alcoholic because I had a lot in my family, I thought I was highly, highly skilled at it. I thought I was a better functioning alcoholic than anyone else I knew and that I had a physical constitution that could handle it on top of that. And that I was not, it, it was fine. I was an alcoholic, but I was doing good. And I kept that delusion up for a long, long time, even though my relationships were cratering. And eventually that career, that company that had been so good to me, I started to fail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So you have the delusion going on. Uh, you're going through all these years. Was there anything that, uh, I guess what you would call turn the corner during that period to make you realize, Hey, maybe I don't have this figured out. Yeah, sure. There were lots and lots of instances like that. I mean, um, I don't have any big, really movie worthy stories to tell, but you know, I certainly did things like I started stripping in the middle of a dance floor, or I had car accidents where I blame the other person where it was clearly my fault or, you know, things of that nature. I never got caught by the law, but that was all played into that whole delusion that I was high functioning. Right. Um, but over time I did start getting very physically sick and I was very, very depressed at the end and I could not maintain personal relationships at all. Um, I wasn't reliable. I couldn't, I couldn't commit to people even when I loved them and be the person who shows up when they said they were going to. And I hated that about myself. Um, but I could not stop drinking. In fact, this 25 year career, I quit that job. Um, and I quit not because I was in any trouble with them, but because I recognized I was failing. I could no longer put on this illusion that I was a high caliber employee. And rather than quit drinking, I quit that job. Now, any sane person would look at that and go, you don't do that. That was 99% of who I thought I was. And I was willing to walk away from it because I couldn't put the bottle down. And you thought they were going to figure you out pretty soon? Or I what? did. I thought they were going to figure me out and my ego being like my worst enemy. I could not tolerate somebody seeing that and exposing that. So I quit. All right. We will be continuing our conversation with Tammy Yu. 
In just a moment, uh, just a reminder, you were listening to Sober Speak. You can find us on the web at www.soberspeak.com. Uh, there, you can also find the donate button on our website, and you can use it if and only if the Spirit moves you to do such. Please keep in mind, this is a podcast funded by you, the listener. Sober Speak is a self-supporting organization through our own contributions. We are not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. We do not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse nor oppose any causes. All right, now back to Miss Tammy Yu. All right, so so now you're at this point to where... Uh, the 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 jig is up so to speak where the work is concerned mm -hmm. uh you're going through depression mm -hmm. did you know about alcoholics anonymous did you start to search it out how did that come about no you know i had a um i quit that job of course started drinking more got another job drank on that job and it, things kept getting worse and i knew i needed to do something but alcoholics anonymous was not on the list of things to do at all <laughs> but what I did is I started calling rehabs and I had this whole vision of what that was going to be. And it was going to be a place that had an infinity pool overlooking a beach. <laughs> and I thought I'd get some self-help courses and maybe a little healthy cooking yeah, information. Healthy cooking, right. And all my problems would be fixed. <laughs> so a plant-based diet will yeah. fix your alcohol. Correct. I don't know what I was thinking, but I didn't understand the disease, even though I'd been exposed to it. And I had these expectations that were clearly off base. So did you go to a rehab? I did not. You know, what I ended up doing is I called California and Florida because, you know, I was very specific about locale. <laughs> and, you wanted uh, to be near an ocean. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, like they have in the movies where right. they're sitting out by the pool. Right. So I got probably the second or third one I called. This lady picked up the phone. I will never forget this woman's name. It was Doreen. I think of her almost daily. She is someone whose last name I will never know and whose face I'll likely never see who changed the course of my life. She told me about the program they offered and she asked me questions about my drinking. She stayed on the phone with me for half an hour talking about my drinking. And at the end of it, she said, you know, honey, have you ever tried a 12 step program? And I said, no, what is that? And she goes, well, Alcoholics Anonymous is an example of that. And I heard her clicking on the other side of the phone on her computer. And she said, okay, I pulled one up. You said you're in the Dallas area. There's one in Irving, Texas called The Gift. Um, and here's the address. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's like less than five miles from my house. Because I lived in Irving at the time. And so the next day I, I went in. Because of that conversation I had with that stranger, that's why I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous. Wow. So what was your first meeting like? I came in, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't really very nervous about it for some reason. Um, I sat down and the first thing that happened is I got there early actually. And I sat down, the guy who was chairing at the time handed me this laminated card with his reading on it. I'm like, holy shit, they can tell I'm new. <laughs> and what it was is it's the reading, how it works that a lot of A right. meetings kick <laughs> off with, but I didn't know that. So, so I'm sitting there and I'm reading it before the meeting starts. And I'm like, okay, they want me to know this, I guess. And I went back to hand it back to him. <laughs> and he's like, no, no, you, you read it when we call on you. So that was my entree into Al Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I was struck by in that first meeting, I don't remember the topic or anything, but I was struck by how people talked about alcohol, how they plan their world around it, how critically important was it to them in experiencing the lifestyle they wanted to have. And, and that's how I felt about it. I came into AA um, thinking, I'll never now be able to experience the kind of life I want to have because I have to give up alcohol. That's how central it was to my life. But they also talked about God and about prayer. And I thought, oh, no, I'm not going to fit. So let's talk about your relationship with or non-relationship with or your your uh, thought process regarding God uh, uh, or a power greater than yourself before you came to the program. What were you thinking? You know, I had uh, grown up in a family. My mother was Lutheran. I grew up Lutheran and we went to church and I liked church. I was on board with all the principles. It wasn't the brow beating church you hear some people talking about. There was nothing that I saw that was wrong with it. But somewhere over my adult years, I, I started tuning it out and I started seeing 
um, in my mind, it started to seem judgmental and superficial to me. And I started to get very judgy about the people who were big Bible thumpers. It was the term I would have used. I wasn't sure if it was real or not. I thought, I still kind of thought maybe it could be, but it didn't seem relevant because if there is a God of any sort, he wouldn't be concerned with details, details being me. And so I didn't see how that was ever going to make any difference. It couldn't possibly help me. And in fact, the, there was a lady who came up my first week in the program um, who offered to be my temporary sponsor. And, and uh, she said, hey, you know, I'll do this for you. And I said, great. But let, you tell me, let me tell you what you're not going to tell me to do. I'm not going to pray. If I call you and say, hey, I want to have a drink, and you say, get down on your knees and pray, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and I am so <laughs> grateful for her, too. It's weird how God brings the right people to us at the right time, because some people would have said, probably, uh, you're not ready, right? If I would have heard that, I would have gone, oh, yeah, I was right. I don't belong here. But she didn't. She smiled at me with his 10,000 watt smile and said, well, why don't we just start with step one? <laughs> <laughs> Let's take this a step at a time, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's great. Like you said, God brings us the people that we need at the time that we need them. Yeah. Uh, and they say when the teacher is ready, or excuse me, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Mm -hmm. All right, so you get started with step one. Uh, how did that go? I know you're going to hit steps two and three here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to have to work through it. I'm yeah. sure there's some sort of... Well, you know, my experience with the steps the first time was very... Uh... I don't know, was it AA light? I guess I would call it that. You know, it wasn't intense. She was not an intense sponsor. We went through the steps fast. What she really focused on is get to meetings, participate, be of service, and connect. Um, so I would say I was done with the steps in the first six weeks of the program. And I realized the desire for alcohol lifted for me within a month, wow. which I was really grateful for that. It's unusual, I think. Yeah. Did you realize that was happening at no, the time? No, no. I woke up one morning, distinctly remember this day. I woke up one morning and first of all, I felt good because already physically I was feeling better and mentally I was feeling better. And as I was sitting there thinking about how good I felt, I realized oh, when is the last time I considered t taking a drink? I could not remember. I couldn't pinpoint it at all. And I was struck by such a profound relief and freedom. And that's when I really started to believe in AA. I mean, it's not that I didn't want to try it up till then, because I did what I was asked to do. But when I started to believe was when I had this profound experience, which that's what it was for me. I had a very similar experience, Tammy. In other words, uh, I, I remember reading through the big book in the 10th step and I'd been, I'd been going through the steps really fast myself, you know, and they did that. My understanding is that's how they did it back in the beginning, you know, and I know different people have different theories about how you work the steps and all that sort of stuff. But I remember reading that in the big book where it said, we will be placed in the position of neutrality. N neither we're fighting it off or, you know, nor swearing it off or however that phraseology goes. And, uh, I thought, oh my goodness, where, I, how, when did this happen? Yeah. Yeah. It was like, I knew I didn't do it. I knew I did not do that. And that's when the whole idea about God and a higher power struck me. Okay. So that's what I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. So what would you describe yourself as up to this point when you said to your first spot, when you said to that sponsor, <laughs> Hey, I'm not going to get down on my knees. Yeah. I'm not going to be afraid. It's not yeah. going to happen. Obviously there was some, some sort of angst you had, uh, and, and you talked about it a little bit, but, um, uh, so how did that shift? Was it from that very moment? It was, it was, it was from the moment that you know, she told me that if I couldn't define a higher power, that at, at the beginning, as the 12 and 12 says, I could use the group of AA as my higher power. And I could buy into that because it was a group of people who had figured something out that I could not. And I found so many things that they said insightful and directionally seemed to be the right path that I admired them and it seemed valid. So that was my first entree into higher power. And it's just through trying the things like I did try prayer and I did try meditation and I tried to tune into whatever might be out there. I was open enough to do that. 
And that I think is what led me to this profound morning where I realized the obsession had been lifted. From there on, I had no doubt any longer after that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So now you're going through the, your, did you go through your fourth step, your fifth step? What, what happened with that? Yeah, no, we went through all the steps. Um, like I said, I think it was AA light. I've gone through them now. I'm going through them for the fifth time now. Um, and none of it, I wasn't, none of it, people talk about, oh, it was so hard and they were so scared. And I, I never, I never felt that going through it. Now, I will say my first sponsor was very candid and completely open about her personal experiences. She shared all that with me first. So by the time it came for me to share my stuff, I, I was completely at ease in doing that with her. Okay. Yeah. When did you get over to Frisco? How did you get over to uh, this end of the world? Uh, people don't know yeah. Irving to Frisco that are listening to this, yeah. but it's probably what, 20, 20, 25 miles away, something like that? Yeah, it is. Well, so I was fortunate. I mean, I ended up, I did end up going back to work again about a year into sobriety in sales again, a small company, good company. Um, I had some success there, but I ended up getting laid off. The company had some trouble. But I was in a good enough financial position to retire at that point. So part of that retirement plan was I needed to get rid of some of my financial overhead, which was this big house I had built when I was trying to prove to the world that I was sufficient. Right. So I sold that and I ended up moving into a condo environment in McKinney, Texas, and researched various groups here by attending meetings. And all of them were very good. But the one I connected to best was the Frisco group because it felt very familiar to the group I got sober in. So was that what did you kind of base your move on uh, the group, so to speak, where you wanted to land? I didn't actually, um, because my plan was I would keep going back to the gift, which was the name of the group, my first group, even though it was all the way across the city. I, I loved that group still do still go over there and visit. Uh, but that wasn't very practical. I still suffer from delusion. You know, that hasn't been removed from me entirely. And I still have bouts of that. And so eventually I recognized I needed a home group closer to home base that I could get to easily where I could connect, get a new sponsor that was right there in the flesh. And so that's how I started jumping around to groups and landed in the Frisco group. So I remember you coming in and I remember, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're very, you know, reserved. And I mean that in a, a, you know, very nice way, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and, and you're, you're still that way. And I, but I know that along the way you've picked up a lot of, uh, sponsees, people mm -hmm. have been attracted to that. So had you sponsored people before you got to the Frisco group? I had not. Okay. The Frisco group was where I started doing that. Um, and that has been the biggest shift. The more lights have gone on from sponsoring people than anything else I've done in the program. And it's not just because people I start working with remind me of exact, I know exactly how they feel, you know? Um, but it's also because after working with them a while, it's not in it at all surprising when I hear insights from them I hadn't come to yet on my own. So it's a very bi-directional street for me, this relationship with my sponsees. And uh, yeah, it's very important part of my sobriety. So tell me a little bit about, you know, like I've said before, we have people that are listening to this podcast right now that are, um, to this episode, I should say, of this podcast, that are considering sobriety. Um, uh, we have a lot of people who tune in here and just think, you know, oh man, maybe this is not for me, mm -hmm. you know, uh, maybe, or maybe it is, um, I'm, I, maybe I don't want to go to those meetings. Maybe I don't want to work the steps. Um, what would you share from your experience that would speak to those people? Well, first of all, I was like that because I was pretty unsure that AA was the right path for me, um, for quite some time. And some of the spiritual and God aspects of it were really off putting, but I decided to try. And here's what I can say that life feels different. Now, this approach I had in life that was always self-protective and kind of, um, highly sensitive to making sure that nobody did me wrong and that I could triumph because that was the only way to be safe. All that has shifted into more of not so much what I'm going to get 
out of grab out of life, but more about what am I going to leave behind? What am I going to be able to contribute? And it's interesting how much color that ends up bringing into your life. I, I would have just rolled my eyes if somebody said that to me initially, because <laughs> I'm not like that. I'm not fluffy, <laughs> right? you know, not at all, but I'm a little fluffy now. Yeah. <laughs> it is true. And it's kind of a lovely way to be, you know, it's not that life doesn't happen. Lots of stuff has happened in six years time. I still worry. I still get off. I still have bad days, but overall I embrace life now. It is important to me. And I was ready to throw it away before I walked in. It's so vastly different. So if you want to just check it out and see if that experience could be a possibility for you, that's all I did. And it worked. The reward was well worth it. What do we always say? Uh, just come on in, give us a try for a while. Uh, if not, we refund we think, your misery. Yeah. We, you yeah. Know, nobody's going to stop you from going out that door. Yeah. Uh, we want you to stay, but we realize not everybody is going to stay. And uh all right. So this has been, uh, this has been great, Tammy. I, I, Tammy, you, uh, <laughs> Tammy University. Um, I really have appreciated you coming in here. I know the listeners are going to enjoy it. God bless you. I'm going to close this out with page 164 of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that is, if I can find it, here it is. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you will surely meet some of us, like me and Tammy, as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. Thank you again, Tammy. I appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thank you so much, Miss Tammy Yu, for coming in and sitting down behind the Sober Speak mic and recording your story. It is so much appreciated. If any of you want to reach out to Tammy or any of the other guests for that matter, you can send me a message to John, J-O-H-N, at SoberSpeak.com, and I will pass those messages on accordingly. And there is something Tammy said there toward the end of her talk uh, that uh, has me reflecting a little bit. And that she said, um, what am I going to leave behind? And I think that's something for me to consider. It may be something that you want to consider for yourself as well. What am I going to leave behind? Thank you so much, Tammy. All right. Now on to a little bit of listener feedback, and then we will bring you that entire Windy Child song called Nobody. Listener de la feedback. Number one up is Vlad. Vladimir. Vlad writes in. He says, hi, John. My name is Vlad. I have been listening to and enjoying your podcast for about three weeks now. I think it is amazing that you are taking time to do this for other alcoholics. I moved here from Russia in 1992 and ended up living 30 minutes outside of Akron, Ohio, out of all places. <laughs> Big O smiley faces three times. God probably saw that I needed to be close to AA's home base, so to speak. I wish... Oh, oh, I have been sober since 5-17-2014. Please add me to the secret Facebook group. Keep up the good work. Much love from Cleveland AA, Vladimir. Well, Vlad, we are so glad you are here in the United States of America from Russia. I bet you drank some of that vodka in your day, huh? I don't know what I'm doing. Sorry, Vlad, you had to put up with that. But anyway, thank you for writing in. And you know what? I have been to Akron, Ohio, and I actually went to uh, Dr. Bob's house. Uh, and if any of you ever get near Akron, Ohio, and you can do that, it is well worth the trip. They actually have 12 steps that lead up to Dr. Bob's house. 
No, those are not original. They put 12 steps in afterwards, but it is a, a great thing to walk up those 12 steps and see where Dr. Bob and his wife Ann lived and uh, see the Bible that they have out on the, the coffee table that they used to read out of for their meetings and uh, see the, the bed that Dr. Bob laid in and where he actually died. And, oh, it's just, uh, it's probably another bed now, but nonetheless, uh, it's just an amazing experience to walk through that house. I had uh, a chills when I was doing that. But Vlad, thank you for writing in, my friend. All right, Liz writes in and she says, Hi, John, I discovered your podcast when I was about 90 days sober. I frequently listen to the podcast, in, to the step podcast in the morning as often as I can. I've listened to David G and Gary K so many times, I think I have them memorized. <laughs> It is hard to put into words how instrumental these episodes have been to, to my sobriety and peace of mind. Your podcast, along with my meetings, my sponsor, reading the big book, and the fellowship of AA are key ingredients to this recipe that, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, has kept me sober for 225 days. God bless you, Liz. Many days I still wrestle with that restless, irritable, and discontent. I understand that, Liz. I find when I start my mornings listening to your podcast while I get ready for work, the tone of my day changes. I'm able to make a shift. I'm able to put into perspective my alcoholism and my sobriety and the center of my life as being the principles of AA. And on those days, things just seem to go better. Thanks for all your time and effort. I would love to be part of the secret Facebook group. Email associated with my account is such and such. Thank you, Liz. Well, Liz, we got you in there. Thank you for writing in. And thank you for all your kind words. And as always to so many of you who write in, I, I, I just say, I'm so thankful that you allow us here at Sober Speak to be a small part of your recovery. And, and uh, I'm just, I feel like we're all one big community. As all of you know, this is a we program. We do this together. Tara writes in, and isn't Tara from the Gone with the Wind? Isn't that the one who talked to Scarlet? Oh, Tara. Anyway, uh, Tara writes in and she says, Hi, John. I am such a huge fan of your podcast. I started listening around day 70 of my sobriety. And now I am on day 164 and feeling strong. Well, how about that? Like the first 164 pages of the big book and you're on day 164. How about that? And Anyway, she says, I travel a bit for work and lately have not been able to attend as many meetings as I would like to slash need, but thank God for your podcast. And I get to listen to other podcasts when I'm traveling. I completely understand that. It always leaves me spiritually full. It allows me to unpack my feelings, inspires me to write, to feel connected to other alcoholics, and to feel far less away from my loved ones and home group as I travel. In these five months of recovery, your show has been an amazing and constant source of information and joy for me. I love your laugh. <laughs> ha ha, she says. Well, Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, she says, thank you so much for this work that you're doing. Couldn't thank you and your guests enough if I tried. Oh, please add me to the super fe secret Facebook group. She gives me her email address and says, sincerely, Tara B. Well, thank you, Tara, for those kind words. I appreciate it. I'm glad we can keep your company while you're gallivanting throughout the country or throughout the world. I don't know, whoever, whoever you are. All right. Anyway, Penelope writes in, what a, what a beautiful name, Penelope. I love that name. Dear John, I get a lot of Dear John letters. I am very grateful. For, I, I am a very grateful Al-Anon member in Arkansas, and I have been enjoying your podcast ever since I discovered it in June. Well, when Spencer T appeared on your podcast. You and your guests give me such hope, uh, give me hope that my loved one will seek recovery one day. 
Well, I pray that they do as well, Miss Penelope. In the meantime, you all help me understand some of the some of her possibilities, thinking, and issues. I appreciate the honesty and vulnerability offered in these talks in the miracle of recovery. You, John, are a wonderful moderator. Oh, well, thank you. I really like the way you ask pertinent questions and then back off and let your guests talk uninterrupted. Well, sometimes it's uninterrupted, but I appreciate it. Since we share the same 12 steps in our programs, it is helpful for me to hear how other people have used those steps. Keep up the good work, Penelope. Well, Penelope, thanks again for writing in. And once again, I pray that your loved one will find recovery uh, someday soon. All right, everybody. That's it. That wraps it up for another week. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. And as promised, as advertised, I am now going to wrap it up with a song from Ms. Wendy Child who will be appearing at our Silver Speak Live event on December 6th. Take it away, Miss Wendy. God bless you, everybody. <laughs>